So most of you should have seen the film by now, Clifford the Big Red Dog. Um, so first I want to welcome the classmate who recommended this film. Uh, Mehui, Yo Mehui, would you like to share with us why you recommended this film? Okay. Um, because I saw this film production from magazines to introduce this young talent actress Abby Kemp due to her natural acting made this thing alive. The people are stunned by her performance in these unreal scenes. So I, I saw if we could watch this movie in the cast, it would be fun. So this is the reason I recommend this movie. OK, thank you. Uh, yes, the lead actress, the little girl, her name is Darby Camp. Um, I also think she did a pretty good job. Uh, and because it's a it's a movie about a big red dog, I'm pretty sure it was guaranteed to be a fun movie. Um, you know, dogs are cute. Their behavior is very fun. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Um, so, class, do you what do you think of the movie? Was it good? Not good? Did you enjoy it? Do you what kind of thoughts do you have about this film? OK, so um, I'll share my thoughts first. Uh, as you know, I have not seen this film before today. I knew that it existed. I also saw the news that this movie came out last year. It's based on a series of children's books, also called Clifford the Big Red Dog. Uh, when I was little, I happened to read a few of them, so I knew the basic idea is that this big red dog goes around uh, making people's lives better. You know, solving problems, making sad people happy, that kind of thing. Um, but I did not know that this would be an origin story. It tells us the beginning of the story of Clifford. This has become a popular thing to do in the movies recently uh, to get, take well-known popular characters and explain how they got started. Um, and this is, I want to thank Mei Hui for recommending this movie because uh, for two main reasons. One, it's a children's movie and we have not had the chance to discuss kids' movies yet. Uh, and the other reason is because um, personally I thought that this movie was OK. It wasn't great, but it wasn't like uh, terrible either. It was somewhere in the middle. And that gives us a chance to talk about uh, things that sometimes movies don't do very well. Um, so and these two ideas are connected because today many people who make children's movies don't understand that kids are also very smart and that kids can tell whether you're trying to bullshit them or not so today a lot of kids movies um they put in cute elements they use simple dialogue and simple characters but they also create uh simple situations simple lessons uh that kind of turn these sort of children's movies into like a classroom lesson, right? After you finish the movie, you're supposed to learn something. But as I'm sure you all remember from your own childhood, nobody likes to go to the movies and end up trying having to learn something. So that's one thing that this film does not do very well. It tries to combine two halves. The first half is a fun story about a, a little girl who suddenly discovers that her little red dog has become a big red dog and is causing problems. 
uh, how will she solve those problems? The other half is the lesson. It's what her big speech at the end is about, right? Just because someone is different doesn't mean that you should treat them uh, poorly, right? You can't bully someone just because they're different. Everybody has to be treated with respect. Now, it's true. Clifford is a big red dog and therefore he is very different. But in the film, the events of the film don't support that lesson. Uh, people are not trying to hurt or steal Clifford because he's different. The evil company tries to steal him to make money. Emily's landlord just doesn't like animals in the house because animals can cause a mess and cause problems, which Clifford does, right? He destroys their home. So while the lesson is true, it does not rise organically, naturally from the events of the movie. Um, Emily is bullied for being new in her school, but being new is something that will change over time, right? After one semester, two semesters, you're no longer new. It's not a real difference. Right, her bully is also a white, beautiful, young sixth grade girl. They all wear the same uniforms. Uh, there is no basis of difference um, for her bullying. Like the one difference that the film does give Emily is that Emily comes from a kind and honest family, right? Her family is the only one uh, that actually goes to collect cans for the charity. Uh, the film uses that honesty as a mark of being a good person. So the only other person who tries is Owen, and that's why they work together to help save Clifford. Uh, the movie thereby tells us that Owen is also a good kid. And from a. Well, we can't say he's from a good family, right? Because his dad stops him from collecting the cans, but he's a good kid. But the character of Owen also has some issues. In an American film, we should always pay attention to what kind of characters are played by non-white people. Because throughout the history of American cinema, non-white actors started out by playing stereotypes, uh, and today we often consider these offensive stereotypes. Uh, later on, the stereotypes became fewer, but non-white actors were still stuck in small roles, supporting roles, simple one-sided characters. And it's not because there's no market. As the past five years have shown, there is a huge market for films starring non-white people. There has always been a market for films starring black people, for example. It's simply due to the conservatism of major film studios. They worry that if you give the lead role to a non-white actor, then white people won't be able to relate to the main character and they won't go to see the movie. On the one hand, that's kind of racist. On the other hand, it's also kind of insulting to white people to say that just because the lead character, the lead actor is not white, therefore they won't be interested in the movie. Um, so. When we examine the role that um, I think the actress name is Isaac Wong or something, the little kid, Owen, what kind of character is he? What roles does he have? First of all, he is, I guess, isolated. We don't see him bullied, but he is isolated for being different. He's the, I think, the only non-white student in Emily's school. Um, by the way, the school itself raises some questions. It's an elite school, mostly for rich families. 
in the US, usually these schools, uh, the students will mostly be white. And the second largest group of students will be Asian because uh, historically Asian Americans do very well on tests in America. So uh, I guess on the one hand, creating that kind of student population for the school in the film is quite accurate. On the other hand, it, it is kind of racist uh, to give Owen basically every job that is se the second most important. He's always the kid staying with Clifford in the truck. Uh, he's the kid who offers skills and resources when Emily needs them. And the fact that he's like a hacker kind of kid is also an early offensive Asian stereotype. That Asians are good at math and computers. Um, so I, I think it's a, a pity that um, this kind of character design did not try to break away from older uh, ideas and stereotypes. Um, now, this is a kid's film. Um, so the tone, the atmosphere is lighthearted, is sometimes funny. Um, again, because many people seem to think that kids can't handle other kinds of emotions, which is not true. It's probably true that you shouldn't make a kid's movie that is completely dark or that has too strong dark emotions, but it doesn't have to be so fun and lighthearted all the way through. Uh, so to create this tone, the film is a comedy. Now uh, we see two kinds of comedy uh, in mo mainly two kinds of comedy in this film. The first one is more related to the idea of a kid's film. It's the big silly uh, clown kind of comedy. So like all the stuff that Clifford does um, is like clowning around. Uh, the character of Owen also like his acting style is very big and obvious and broad. Uh, the kind of uh, clowning comedic performance. Think for example of when Clifford farts in the van and it gets very stinky. Owen, the character's reaction is like to make that, oh, it's so stinky movement uh, and keep complaining and to make a face. Right, that's classic clown humor. The other kind of humor is more sarcastic, uh, based on the use of language and the uh, different attitudes toward a situation. Uh, so mo most of this is from the interaction between Emily and Casey, and it's probably also related to the fact that Casey is played by the comedian Jack Whitehall. Uh, as a comedian, his uh, stand up comedy is also quite sarcastic. Um, so I'm not sure whether they wrote the character and then chose him or they chose him and then wrote the character based on him, but it fits his comedy style quite well. Uh, and that brings us to Emily, most of her comedy is in dialogue with Casey, and because sarcasm depends on a kind of metacognition, which means that you're aware of the entire situation, whether it's a funny situation or it's a normal situation or it's a silly situation. And so you can make a comment on the entire situation. You're not just reacting to the person, you're talking about the whole situation. That's the basic structure of a sarcastic comedy. So when the film gives Emily these sarcastic lines, it makes her look smarter, which is good, um, but it also means that her lines are sometimes too um, self-aware. Right, too 
understanding of the situation. Kids can be sarcastic, not too young kids, but like older kids, like fourth, fifth and sixth grade kids. They understand sarcasm, but their use of sarcasm is not yet so accurate. They understand that there's something strange or funny about a situation, but how they joke about it sometimes is not exactly uh, descriptive of that situation. So giving Emily such accurately sarcastic lines makes her feel a little fake. It makes it feel like she's an actor delivering lines. But it gets even worse when Emily is not sarcastic. So Emily has three basic kinds of lines, right? First, she's joking with or about Casey. Second, she's reacting to a situation or she's trying to get people to do something. And then third is when she's talking about her own feelings. Uh, we talked about the humor, reactions and orders. So like when Clifford does something, she reacts to Clifford. Uh, when they need to do something, she says to Casey, you know, we need to get Clifford to the vet or something. The second kind of dialogue is a kind of exposition. In a better film, you wouldn't need this dialogue because the situation itself will be clear enough for the audience. You don't have to tell the audience what you need to do next. The third kind of dialogue um, basically is when she talks back to her bully in school and at the ending when she gives that big speech. In both cases, her lines are supposed to give us the moral center of the film. Uh, but as I just mentioned, that moral center is not connected with most of the events of the film, so it also doesn't feel real. It feels like an actor is just saying things on the page. This is a bigger problem in the big speech at the end. Even if we take that speech and look at it separate from everything else, that speech itself is a terrible speech. I don't know if you have ever tried to write a good rousing speech that will inspire people, but that speech just did not feel inspiring. It again felt like a lecture. It felt like the movie was trying to teach us something. And because that speech did not feel inspiring, when we get the reaction of the crowd, it also feels fake. Uh, how are they so inspired by this crappy speech? And so the whole ending feels like um, like we can see what the ending was trying to do, but it doesn't succeed. If they could give Emily a better speech, I think it would have worked better. Um, now at the beginning, uh, your classmate Mei Hui mentioned that uh, Darby Camp gave a good performance, and I agree. The problem is her lines as we've been talking about, feel so fake that for some scenes she's trying her best, but she can't find the authenticity of her character in that situation. So again, the big ending speech, which is a terrible speech. If you look at her acting in that scene, she's trying very hard to find like how to deliver this speech in the most emotionally effective way. Which parts need to feel personal? Which parts need to feel more energetic? What is the arc? But because the speech doesn't have an arc, because the speech doesn't have a good speech structure, so she, uh, the actor has trouble locating those key moments in the speech. And so it ends up that her performance of the speech looks like she's trying and has not succeeded in uh, really understanding that moment for the character. So it's a it's good acting from a talented child actress, but the film doesn't really help her. Uh, doesn't help her performance. 
Uh, I think there are two other things that we can talk about. One is the use of music. For a movie like this, the tone is, as I said, was fun and lighthearted, uh, which means that when you want to create different kinds of emotions in the audience, you will probably have to rely on music. The other main tool to help orient audience emotion is editing. What scenes should move slower? What scenes should move faster? Unfortunately for this film, the editing was not very good in this sense. Every scene moves very fast. The entire film feels like it goes at one speed. Um, for example, at the uh, like at the end of every scene. Um, so like when we move from one scene to the next scene, so not just one shot to the next shot, but one scene to the next scene. Usually we want to feel like the first scene has ended before we move on to the next scene. But I don't think there was a single OK, there was like one or two scenes starring um, Mr. Bridwell, the magical pet salesman. The ending of those scenes slowed down. We get an ex we get a slightly longer shot of the actor John Cleese who who plays Mr. Bridwell. But for every other scene, as soon as the audience gets the key information, as soon as the actor says the key line or the important events have happened, we immediately cut to the next scene. We don't have a sense that the first scene has already ended. We don't have time to digest what has happened. Um, and so since the editing doesn't help guide the audience, the film relies very heavily on a score, the music. Uh, the music itself sounds this very similar to many other lighthearted children's movies. Uh, use of violin, uh, use of, uh, I think that was, um, what do you call those, mellotrons? Like the, the metal bars that you can hit. Uh, use of flute, woodwind. Um, all very common instruments to in use in this kind of film. So the music was not itself very special, um, but it it does the job, right? When the music turns dark, you can tell something bad will happen or like an evil character has appeared. Uh, when the movie brightens up and like gets louder and moves faster, you can tell that we're about to enter a new scene or like some action is going to happen. And then for the really exciting parts of the film, you get pop music. Uh, this was a trend that I believe was started by Taylor Swift in The Secret Life of Pets. It opened with her song, Welcome to New York, it is one of the earliest instances of using pop music for uh, emotional high points in a children's movie. Maybe there was an earlier example, but I can't remember. And the other part of this film I wanted to bring your attention to is the use of digital effects, CGI. I'm sure you could tell that the big red dog was not real. Uh, and therefore, the film could have Clifford give human reactions. When you use real animals, you have to train them to react in the ways that you want them to react. Uh, and so not everything will be perfect. Sometimes you will have to use other tricks to attract the animal's attention or to get them to be, be uh, perform in a certain way. But with the CGI dog, you could just get the dog to act human. Uh, so that makes things slightly easier. But when you have human actors interacting with a CGI actor, uh, you mainly come up against the problem that the human actors, when they're performing, they don't actually see, in this case, the big red dog. They, they probably look at 
another actor wearing a costume, or sometimes they just look at a, a mark like a tennis ball. 现场会摆一根杆子，然后杆子上面放一个网球，然后演员就要对着网球演戏。Uh, so Natalie Portman has said that CGI acting is the purest form of acting because you can only depend on your own imagination. In some of the scenes, that was kind of obvious, uh, and I think it's actually more a problem with the CGI than with the human actors. If you're creating the CGI after you shoot uh, the human actors, you have to make the dog react to the humans, or you have to make the dog behave in a way that, that would make the humans act in that way. Right, you have to make their interaction believable, but in some scenes, I think it was not very convincing. The dog behaved in a way that um, did not exactly fit how the humans were reacting. Another way to say this is that when the human actors were acting, they did not yet see in detail what Clifford would do, and so their reactions did not feel very specific. It felt like a more general reaction, like maybe the script said uh, Clifford smiles, and so uh, the actors react to their idea of Clifford smiling, whereas if you could actually see a big red dog smiling at you, you would behave in a more specific way. So this is a danger that all films with human CGI interactions face. How do you get specific performances from your actors that fit what you will create using CGI? The other thing is uh, the physics of the CGI creation. Here I'm talking about dog behavior, the, the movement of its ears, the behavior of its fur, does it mal the bianhua? Physics, wu li shui, how do these things move through space? From the very first time that we saw Clifford running, right, the little dog in the big warehouse, he's running towards the closing door. I felt like the physics were wrong. It did not exactly look like how a dog's body would behave in space. The ears were falling too slowly. The legs uh, did not move exactly right. Something a was a little bit off. And so throughout the movie, the most, for me at least, the most convincing parts uh, were like the, the parts where we get the most convincing performances from Clifford are when Clifford is not moving. For example, when he's sleeping, or when he's lying down looking at somebody else, when he's sitting down wagging his tail, uh, is slightly more accurate and it feels more more like an actual dog. This, I think, would not be a problem if the dog were not so big. Because the dog is so big, when we get shots of human characters, we focus more closely on the dog, right? We get more a close up shot of different parts of the dog. And so we like the the imperfections are more obvious. Clifford, I don't think costs too much money to make. Like it probably costs like, I don't know, $40 million. I have to actually let me let me check online. But it, it doesn't look like it costs like $200 million. Uh, and the CGI, if they had more money, they should have spent it on the CGI for the dog. Ah, I was close. It's It cost $64 million. Uh, so that's considered a mid-budget film. Uh, uh, today, 
if you make a movie for only one million dollars, that is considered a low budget. So 64 million is mid mid budget, especially because they had to spend money creating this digital dog. But if they had a larger budget, they sh if they had had a larger budget, they should have spent it on the dog to make it look uh, more convincing. Because after all, uh, that is the key selling point of this movie. There's a big red dog. Uh, I think unfortunately one reason that they made they didn't have enough resources to make this movie is because it's a kid's movie. They're thinking that a kid's movie probably won't make as much money. Uh, they're thinking that kids probably won't care if the CGI is not perfect. But again, kids are very good at detecting bullshit. Um, I'm sure if you asked a kid what they thought about the design of the dog, they would say it was big and cute, but it was like not very real, something like that. As for whether a kid's movie can make a lot of money, a good kid's movie can make a lot of money. As movie studios know, kids like to rewatch good movies. They go over and over and over again, and because kids are little, they usually don't go alone. They drag their parents to go with them, so that's automatically two tickets for every kid. Uh, every time they go to see the movie. Um, so like if you invest more time and energy into making a good kids movie and the marketing Xing Shao, is done very well, uh, it can make money. It's no excuse. It's just more conservative thinking from film studios. Uh, and like because film studios know that kids will bring their parents, so kids movies will often sometimes in, uh, will often include some kinds of more adult humor. In this case, it was the sarcasm. The sarcasm was not aimed at the kids. It was aimed at the parents who take the kids. The joke was for the parents. Let's see. Did I want to mention anything else? Oh yes, uh, the sound of the actors when they're delivering their lines. Special tights at us all. It was so obvious that it was ADR. And you can tell because uh, if you're if you're doing very good ADR, you won't just stand at the microphone and say your lines. Depending on the volume of your lines, whether it's a loud line or a quiet line, depending on the environment that the character is in, you will position yourself in different relationships with the microphone. You might stand far away and shout. Or you might stand at an angle. You might like use something to half block your voice if it's more realistic to the scene. But in this movie, every line, for example, delivered by Emily sounds like she was standing right in front of the microphone. Uh, and that's also something that makes the movie slightly less convincing. Like when she's running and she's panting, Chuan Chida saying, it sounds like she's still standing in the same place in front of the microphone. This can take a more detailed design uh, for the dialogue sound. It would make the movie sound more convincing. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's about it. Do you guys have other thoughts on this movie? Do you disagree with what I'm saying? Leave a comment, hit like and subscribe. I mean, sorry, sorry. Uh, feel free to say what you think. Okay. Um, 
So as I said last week, what did I say last week? Oh yes, um, I will later post a PDF of an article that I think discusses this film uh, very well. And you're welcome to read it if you're interested. I'll post it sometime before um, next class. Yes, we have another class. Um, because the coordinated final exams have been canceled, so we have to do week 18. Um, so next week, um, we're going to be talking about romance, pre-code cinema from the 1930s, uh, and I'll talk to you guys in Chinese. So if you don't understand Chinese, please tell me. OK, so questions. Do you have questions about anything? OK, if not, let's look at. The final exam. The rules are the same as for the midterm exam. You should give specific details from the film I'm asking you to watch. Um, if you use information from other sources, give me the, the source of that information. And also tell me which part of your answer does that information come from. It's not enough just to list your information at the end. Uh, um, and also try to write your answer in the form of an essay. Okay, so the final exam will begin as soon as class ends today, and it will continue until just before midnight next Thursday. Let's take a look at the question. Uh, watch this thing. Huh, it's not supposed to be here. It's supposed to be a link. This film is. Hang on, let me. Find the original film. This film is something special. It is. Not. Uh, it, this this version of the film was not created by the original filmmaker. The original film is this one, Backstory by Joshua Laukenix. And you can see the original film here. What I want you to watch is someone, don't know who, took the original film, re-edited the film, and changed the soundtrack. All of the sound has been replaced by the Radiohead song, Everything in Its Right Place. So watch this film. It's as you can see, it's like. Uh, it's not six minutes long there. The ending is all black. Which is on purpose. You can talk about the black part too. But watch this. Um, talk again. How does it make you feel? How do you think it achieves these emotional effects? 
but this time I want you to try to mention at least um, three data details from the film that are related to what we have talked about in the second half of the semester. Visual and special effects. The use of technology in the story. Desire, symbolism, realism and irrealism and melodrama. If you want, you can also talk about uh, what we discussed in the first half, right? Editing, sound, camera work, that kind of thing. Uh, but in your for for purposes of grading, I will be looking at these parts from the second half of the semester. So, you should see this movie. In your answer, uh, the answer is you think this movie is really good. You think it's 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 really good. 我们下半学期上的这些单元的东西，你们要提到上半学期的内容也可以，但是打分数来说，我只会看下半学期的内容。Questions? OK， 是你那个，啊、是你你说那个提到的下学期嗯、呃、教的细节，那内容大概要每一项要写到多少？嗯、um, ，就是 I, right right as long as you <笑> as long as you mention it and it's related to some detail in the film, that's OK. 所以你们电影里面某一个细节要连起来，或是某一个就是时间点的事情的,的事件或场景之类的。OK， 好，呃，啊 ，Thank you。Other questions？ 好、okay, um, ，Let me give you the link, and I will be here to answer questions that you may think of. I'll be here until the end of class. So the the question is on the screen. The film is the link to the film I posted on Teams. And I will be here to answer questions. If you don't have questions, you are free to go. See you next week. <laughs>